Sorry, I'm doing double duty. I'm going to, uh, and by the way, the, the screen behind me is an actual virtual background. It's a virtual background of a green screen. I thought you might find that interesting, just a, a little bit of a departure from the normal way of, of doing the, the green screen. <laughs> and if you believe that, then you'll possibly believe anything. Okay, here we go. All right, so let me know, use the chat button if you're able to see the um, information that I'm, I'm putting up there. I have to see this here. Okay. Okay, I guess everybody can see that. Okay, one moment. Okay. So Stanley Hiller Jr. Imagination Set Free. I thought it would be an interesting opportunity for us to explore a little bit about this icon of aviation. We have a museum named after him after all, here at the Hiller Aviation Museum. And it's not everybody knows what his story is. So I thought I would share that with you tonight. It all begins at the end of the 19th century with Stanley Hiller Sr., who is a uh, fellow who is enrolled in the Society of Aviation Pioneers Early Birds. He was actually one of the very first aviators. The uh, Early Birds is a group of folks that um, either flew a glider, piloted a gas balloon, or an airplane prior to December 17th, 1916. And there are 598 such people and Stanley Hiller Jr. or Stanley Hiller Sr. was one of them. He had built his own airplane and uh, built a monoplane, which he took to the very famous Tan Faran uh, air meet in 1911. Let's see here. I'm going to basically relaunch the screen share. Sorry. There we go. At the 1911 Tanferan Air Meet, and this was a state-of-the-art gathering of aircraft. So this was really, in 1911, that's only three years or so after aviation was just getting started, which was around 1908. Even though the Wright brothers flew in 1903, it really took about five years before you started to see aircraft going into production and starting to fly and be visible. So within three years, we already had a state-of-the-art meeting of aircraft here in the Bay Area. And this little, uh, uh, open area there was a racetrack, um, and that is where the shops at Tan Faran are currently located in San Bruno right now. Out in the distance is kind of a swamp, a wetlands, and that is where Mills Field eventually would be built, or San Francisco International Airport, but it was just an open uh, marsh back then in 1911. So you can see all these different aircraft at the air meet, some uh, French aircraft, an Antoinette, a Farman, a couple of Wright Model Bs down here, and Stanley Hiller. He actually had his monoplane uh, carted up and he uh, got it across the bay and pushed it to the air meet. And it is in this picture somewhere. There it is. It's actually a pile of wreckage right there. That's his airplane. Uh, it was not damaged by a flight accident, it was actually damaged when a lighting tower at the exhibition fell on top of his airplane and destroyed his airplane. But, but his, his airplane is in the picture, so there it is. Um, he, of course, like a lot of other people in the early days of aviation, reconfigured his airplane as a seaplane because that was how you got in and out of the sky because the, uh, there was no infrastructure of runways or places for airplanes to land or take off for the most part. So uh, dock facilities and things that were more nautically oriented made for perfect uh, infrastructure for aircraft. So seaplanes were a big thing or float planes at least 
uh, back at the beginning of aviation. So this is Stanley Hiller Sr. who is creating all of this. He's in the Society of Aviation Pioneers, the Early Birds. Again, 598 people who are in that club. So it's a very um, exclusive uh, group of folks. Let's see here, I'm trying to let people in from the waiting room here. Well, along comes in 1924, while Stanley Hiller Sr. is in his 30s, his young son here in teenage years, Stanley Hiller Jr. And kind of a chip off the old block, Stanley Hiller Jr. was also a mechanical inventor inclined person. His father was an inventor. Again, he built an airplane. He actually created a food processing industrial business uh, around uh, food processing technology. And young Stanley Hiller Jr. was very much a tinkerer uh, growing up as well. In fact, he created his own line of toys. This is the uh, Hiller Comet, which is actually a gasoline powered car. He created his own corporation to sell it called Hiller Industries. And here's an ad from 1940. So he's about 15 years old. Uh, and when these things got going, I mean, when the, when the uh, company got going, he was selling uh, so over a hundred of these things a month with annual sales of around $100,000 a year. And this was for a young teenager in the 1940s. So he actually had a, a going concern here called Hiller Industries. And while the war was going on, um, he was able to secure government contracts because pretty much the US government was looking for any machine shop anywhere that could fabricate parts for this, that, or the other thing. And uh, young Stanley Hiller was able to do aluminum extrusion and he has all of these uh, contracts for parts. Aren't sure what they were for. They look like pulleys and different elements of machinery, but that is what introduced young Stanley Hiller Jr. to the world of government contracts which would of course play a, a role down the, down the road. Also during World War II, we saw the world's first production helicopter come online. This is Igor Sikorsky, the Russian immigrant out on the East coast of the United States who uh, brought a helicopter uh, to fruition in production and manufacture and the army bought it in 1942. And of course the young Stanley Hiller is looking at all this going, well, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm an aviator too. Stanley Hiller Jr. was able, uh, learned to fly fixed wing aircraft as just a teenager, his, his, his father taught him that. But he also felt he could build a helicopter as well. So he enlisted some engineering help from the uh, folks that worked for his father and out in Alameda where they lived out in the East Bay anyway, he, uh, uh, put a team together and they started to build a helicopter with a rather interesting and radical design based on two rotors. Uh, and you can see the masthead here without the rotors on the top. So this is a, the team that put the helicopter together and you can see the young Stanley Hiller there. He's only 19 years old, trying to look uh, uh, authoritative and managerial. This is a kind of an interesting shot. The aircraft was tethered to a big block and when they ran up the engine, the uh, lift essentially being generated by the rotors sucked down all the skylights. So the whole place was covered in shattered glass right after this picture was taken. But it, it did prove that this aircraft wanted to fly. It was generating lift. And uh, the, the biggest obstacle that Stanley J uh, Hiller Jr. had in building this helicopter was getting an engine for it because the war was on and you could not buy an engine anywhere. The government requisitioned all of the engines and you had to actually petition the government to get an engine. And uh, uh, young Stanley Hiller Jr. actually had to go to Washington DC to lobby to get an, a Franklin engine that he could use in his aircraft. And there he is. Now, of course, uh, it's one thing to build a helicopter, but then you have to fly it. And since nobody's building helicopters, you're one of the first. Nobody knows how to fly helicopters. So you have to teach yourself how to fly the helicopter without killing yourself. And so there are some interesting shots of the XH-44 uh, being flown by the young Stanley Hiller, 19 years old. He had one semester at Cal at, um, at Berkeley, UC, and uh, before he dropped out because he had helicopters to build and a business to run. But he got the use of Memorial Stadium to do uh, flight testing of his 
XH44. And there he is in stable flight, wearing a nice t-shirt, looking stylish. Uh, no hands with the two rotors counter rotating is a very stable aircraft. Well, this is during the height of World War II. World War II is coming towards the ending phase at this point. There he is, by the way, with his father. So uh, Stanley Hiller Sr. and Jr. together. But young Stanley Hiller Jr. did attract the attention of another big industrialist in the Bay Area, and that was Henry Kaiser. So he's up in Richmond building Liberty ships. And of course he has docks and shipyards up in Washington state as well, uh, building escort carriers and other things of that nature. But he also wanted to get into the aviation business. And he, like many others thought that there was gonna be a big market for aviation products after the war. Uh, there were gonna be a lot of surplus aircraft available and there were gonna be a lot of pilots looking to do something with aircraft. So he was intrigued by what young Stanley Hiller Jr. did. And he actually, basically brought uh, Hiller's Enterprise into Kaiser Cargo. And so the first corporate version of Hiller Aircraft was actually as a division of Kaiser Cargo. So the Hiller Copter Division. People often ask, you know, is that where the name helicopter came from, from Hiller Copter? No, no, helicopter goes back, I don't know what, to Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, because of the helical uh, twisting nature of some of the early ideas about how to achieve vertical flight. But helicopter was a, a clever uh, uh, play on words there. And so here he is getting his business started in 1944. By the way, the original U8 or the, the XH-44 aircraft um, is on display in Washington at the National Air and Space Museum in the Udver Hazy Center. So if you ever go out to Washington to check out the airplanes at the um, National Air and Space Museum, you have to go to the Dulles Airport extension there, the Udver Hazy Center, and you can see all the helicopters and including the XH-44, the uh, very first one built by Stanley Hiller. We have a replica that we've built essentially a ground runnable replica that has all the drive train and all of the, the um, motive elements uh, in play. We just don't ever run it up because we don't wanna grind it up, but we have what could potentially be turned into an airworthy vehicle at the Hiller Aviation Museum. So Stanley Hiller Jr. starts working on helicopters. And this is, you know, in the 1945, 1946 era. His relationship with Kaiser Cargo didn't last long. It was about a year before he actually ended up having to bring in other investors to create uh, his own company, Hiller Aircraft. Uh, that company then changed its name to United Helicopters. So sometimes you will see United Helicopters as uh, the name for the company. So here he is in a test bed aircraft, uh, working out the kinks with a dual rotor, counter rotating uh, uh, helicopter. And there he is with his young wife, which I believe uh, he, he married in 1946, uh, Carolyn. So uh, of course the marketing aspects being shown off here about the stability of the aircraft that you know anyone could fly it, even somebody who doesn't know how to fly a helicopter. And the dream was a helicopter in every garage. So this was what Henry Kaiser was imagining was gonna happen after the end of World War II. There was gonna be this huge, demand for aviation products and helicopters and things like that. And uh, here you have the UH-4 commuter, which we have the only prototype existing of in our museum collection on display, but there it is in front of their home in, in the East Bay there. So a helicopter in every garage, that is a pretty futuristic looking picture. United Helicopters then began, began producing helicopters in the late 40s. And they built a factory out on Willow Road. So if you know the Bay Area at all, let me orient you in this picture. This is actually Willow Road and this is 84 coming in right here, going right out to the Dumbarton Bridge over to Fremont. This is where Facebook is right now. Uh, and this is of course all industrial uh, business parks and so forth today. And I think this is about where uh, Facebook building 57 is located roughly in this area where the old Hiller United Helicopters factory was. So you can see that was just, you know, an empty uh, zone of swamp and wetlands out there on the east side of the uh, Bay Shore Highway. So Hiller starts making helicopters and of course the, the uh, eventual 
hope is to create one that will catch on. And by 1951, you can see, look at, look at the, all the different kind of helicopters that are parked out in front of uh, you know, the factory uh, doors there. And you can see this is the Hiller 360, which was sort of the breakout helicopter that it was actually starting to, to sell in large numbers. But imagine that, you know, this is a person who's not even in, in his 30s yet. He's still a 20 year old. And look at all the things that he's accomplished there. You know, if I had just built one of those things as a home builder, you know, that would be the great accomplishment of my lifetime. But, you know, here he is, he's, he's produced this whole line of helicopters. So this is quite an impressive achievement for uh, a 20 something. So there it is, the Hiller 360 certified in 1948. And I love these incredible marketing shots. So there you can see Stanley Hiller, he's actually, on the side there, there's no one in the cockpit. You know, he's crawled out and is sitting on the edge of the, you know, the engine cowling uh, back there and showing off how stable the aircraft is. I don't know that that's a great idea for uh, your company CEO. Eventually the uh, legal department of his uh, fledgling company came to him and let him know that, you know, we can't buy insurance policies if you're going to be hanging off the sides of aircraft. So this kind of stunts featuring Stanley Hiller Jr. began to be less often seen. The Hiller 360 though, did have an interesting career. Uh, at about that same time, you had the French in what is uh, now Vietnam, that was the, the French Indochina War. And Hiller helicopters were actually used in that war, but in an interesting way. They were pioneered in their use as medical evacuation vehicles by a uh, combat surgeon named Captain Valerie André, uh, who is a, the, the person who basically invented helicopter emergency evacuation rescues. So she got into a Hiller 360, flew it into the front lines, helping extract wounded soldiers to a rear area where medical personnel could work on them. So she kind of single-handedly invented uh, medical evacuation by helicopter, learned how to fly a Hiller 360, and she in France did helicopter flight training to create this capability. Uh, by the way, Captain Valerie uh, André is still alive. So she's, in, of course, lives in France, but uh, we have seen her at the Hiller Aviation Museum maybe about 20 years ago when the museum first opened. So these uh, Hiller 360s, the military designation for them was H-23A, uh, were sold to the Army. And indeed, you know, during the early 50s, the Hiller Aircraft Company or United Helicopters, their best sales years were during the Korean War, which uh, ultimately became you know, the big users of these helicopters. Uh, these were not combat vehicles. These were uh, being assembled in large quantity here at the Willow Road factory um, to be used in medical evacuation and as observation helicopters. Now, when we think of medical evacuation helicopters, we always think of the iconic Bell 47, which was also used and was a competitor of Stanley Hiller Jr., the, the big, the big uh, competitor, uh, Stanley Hiller Jr.'s company was the smaller company. And of course, you know, the, the story of MASH, the mobile army surgical hospitals that uh, were set up and deployed near front lines in the Korean War. And so there's the TV show, there's the movie about MASH featuring the Bell 47. But in fact, there were also lots of Hiller 360s or the H23A uh, that were used uh, for the same purpose. And that's an actual picture of a real MASH, not quite as glamorous as the one from the TV show. Uh, but you can see the, the Hiller uh, 360 or the H23 in action there. And so they, they were used in other uh, parts of the military too. The other relationship that Hiller had was with the Office of Naval Research and with the US Navy and, and you know, between the Army and the Navy, he was finding a client for the light helicopter, the light observation helicopter. And you would see when you went to the movies, Helicopters, and indeed it's fun to kind of look around and find during this period of time where Hiller helicopters might have showed up. And this is one of my favorite movies from 1951, maybe it's one of yours, when roles collide and there's a Hiller helicopter in it. 
Uh, so there's a, a Hiller 360 that's used in a, one of the scenes of the movie where they're rescuing a small child after the, the right before the worlds collide. Um, I hate it when that happens, when the worlds collide like that. But anyway, so th that is a Hiller 360. I noticed, though, that they took all the insignia off of it. So you just could not identify the helicopter. James Bond movies used a lot of Hiller helicopters. Uh, Goldfinger had a helicopter sequence with a Hiller aircraft and then from Russia with Love also featured James Bond being chased around by a Hiller 12C, which exploded. That's one of the things about a lot of these films with Hiller helicopters, for whatever reason, the helicopter tends to explode at some point in the sequence. Um, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes is another uh, movie that has a Hiller aircraft in one of the sequences. There are about 30 different films that over the years have had Hiller aircraft. So people got to see Hiller aircraft out there. But what they actually did is become somewhat of a uh, reputation as being a pickup truck helicopter, a helicopter with a lot of utility, not, not a, a super heavy lift aircraft, but it could lift a lot. Look, it's lifting 1,800 pounds right there. This is a Hiller 12D prototype of the 12E. Uh, but they were very uh, easy to maintain compared to some of the other helicopters, their linkages and control systems and the uh, unique patented Hiller rotormatic system that helped uh, uh, whirl the rotors uh, disc around was all easily serviced. And so these were considered to be very maintainable helicopters and were very popular. And in fact, the 12E helicopter is the helicopter that you see the most uh, still flying today. It, it had the largest civil production, at least from the information that I have, there were 793 of them built uh, and there are still hundreds of them still out there. And lots of different clients, you know, in which uh, uh, you will find the Hiller aircraft serving for the Royal Navy in this case. And we see them a lot still, even today, as agricultural workhorses. So they do spraying and things like that. Back not that long ago when we were having a Mediterranean fruit fly problem in the Bay Area and there was a lot of spraying going on, a lot, we, we could look out our window and see Hiller helicopters uh, doing some of that work. And I thought it would be fun to uh, take a, a quick look at a video. Let me see if I can get it to go. I'll do this first. Hang on. We want to be able to see a Hiller 12 in flight. So let's do that. Thank you, Skipping it, skipping ahead a little bit. <clears throat> so there, you, I mentioned them as being workhorses. So this is a long line work.
So that's a pretty skilled uh, pilot there, dropping those Christmas trees like that right into the uh, <laughs> into the uh, bucket there. Um, so by 1962, you can see the scale of the factory there on Willow Road, how much it's changed from that early initial building. It was a fairly large complex by 1962 with a lot of challenges and financial challenges as well that came with it. There was one other little piece of the Hiller Aviation factory area that is of note, and that is this advanced research division of Hiller Aircraft. Um, what's interesting about it is the fact that it is not just a research facility for Hiller aircraft, it was also a cover used by the CIA to construct and fabricate the Corona spy satellites, which was a Lockheed project. They used the facilities of the Hiller aircraft company up here on the peninsula instead of down in Sunnyvale to actually put the Corona uh, satellites uh, together. Corona was a very early spy satellite system, which was completely photographic based. So they would launch these rockets from Vandenberg Air Force Base into polar orbit. And the satellite would go out and take pictures of the Soviet Union or whatever. And then they would drop the camera by parachute back into, it was already in low earth orbit. And then it would just kind of drop the film back and an airplane would pick it up out of the air on a, para, on a parachute. But this is an interesting uh, activity of the uh, Hiller aircraft during this period. It was used surreptitiously by the CIA to uh, do the, um, um, the Corona spy satellite. Now, working our way to the uh, mid 60s, we're reaching the, the climax of the founder period of the company because at this point, Hiller aircraft was its back was against the wall financially. And it was in one of these unenviable situations where it had to win a government contract or go bankrupt. Uh, so it was in a must win contract bidding situation. And it was uh, a re request for proposals had gone out from the army for an observation helicopter, which is of course Hiller's specialty. And they had a great one, the OH-5A ready to go that they submitted in the competition for the, for the, uh, the bid. They had a competitor, his name was Howard Hughes. And Howard Hughes also had a uh, light observation helicopter. And it turned out his helicopter on paper appeared to be cheaper to build than the Hiller aircraft was. And so the Hiller aircraft company did not win this must win contract with the government, but Hughes did. And it drove Hiller aircraft to bankruptcy at that point. Now, when the uh, uh, Hiller Aircraft Company went out of business and the, the uh, uh, army came to Howard Hughes and said, okay, well, we're ready for our light observation helicopter. Could you start building it for us, please? He basically said, well, I can't build it for the price I said that I could. And he paid something like a $70 million fine to get out of the contract with the army. And the only reason that he underbid Hiller was to drive Hiller out of business. So it was one of those nasty aviation uh, kind of bidding wars that went on. The very last production helicopter that Hiller Aircraft was, was making was the uh, 1100. And when Hiller Aircraft was then bought by Fairchild Aircraft, not to be confused with Fairchild Electronics, this is a fair, different company, Fairchild Aircraft out on the East Coast, I think in Pennsylvania. Uh, they bought the, the company and it become, became Fairchild Hiller for a, a couple of years and you saw this late model Hiller aircraft, the FH 1100. And so that is the last one of what I would call the founding period. So basically from 1944 to about 1964 were the years of uh, Hiller's autonomous operation under its leader, Stanley Hiller Jr. And these are all the different names that the Hiller Aircraft Company went by over the years. You know, you had his little fledgling company making the Hiller Comet car in the 1940s there and then Hiller Aircraft and then the div uh, division of Kaiser Cargo and so forth and all the different names of the Hiller Aircraft Company. Uh, pretty much that logo is mostly ubiquitous. You do see that around a lot. But they are gone but not forgotten because there are still a lot of Hiller Aircraft out there. They're not being built anymore as complete aircraft yet. I I'll qualify that in a second. But there is certainly a demand for parts. 
And so I'm, I'm just tracing very quickly some of the post-founder uh, activity. The son of Stanley Hiller Jr., Jeff Hiller, actually uh, with a group of uh, some Thai investors actually bought the company's uh, uh, assets and intellectual property. And they, they founded a company for producing uh, parts for Hiller Aircraft. Then in the early 2000s, there was a joint venture between the uh, US uh, group of uh, Hiller investors and a Chinese group because there was a huge demand in China for helicopters and they wanted to uh, see if they could get the Hiller helicopters manufactured in China. Now, some of this same investment group <clears throat> formed a company called uh, Hiller Group Incorporated and I think it's incorporated in the state of Nevada. And they are operating today with a tiny, well, not too tiny, a, a factory in a uh, town between here and Fresno, somewhere in the Central Valley. I think it's called Fireball. And they are producing Hiller parts for Hiller aircraft and refurbishing Hiller aircraft back to airworthy status. And you know, the goal is to get them to be able to manufacture Hiller aircraft. So the CEO of that of the company, it's called Hiller Aircraft, is Michael Tregars, who is a former United Airlines pilot, and he's the CEO of the, the uh, Hiller Aircraft company right now. And this is their little factory out in Fireball, California, where they are basically machining parts uh, to service the still flying Hiller aircraft and bringing uh, Hillers to airworthy status. And this is as recently as just this last month. I mean, if you go onto their website, which is hilleraircraft.com, you can check it out. You know, they have postings as recent as December, 2020. So the pandemic may have put them in a holding pattern, but you know, they, they are a going concern. So uh, now for our part at the Hiller Aviation Museum, we're not a repository for the Hiller Aircraft uh, Corporation. All of those documents and blueprints and so forth have scattered to a million different companies and corporations over the years. Uh, but we are sort of the custodians of some of the lore of the Hiller uh, aircraft, including the innovations along the way. So there were, you know, a, a mandate that Stanley Hiller had for himself and his investors to make money. And so he had to make some helicopters that people could buy. But people came to Hiller to build prototypes that were quite interesting. And you know, his imagination went into all sorts of different directions about using helicopters to recover spacecraft uh, during their reentry procedure and all of those kinds of things. And even as a 20 year old, he was in the pages of these uh, uh, popular digests and magazines, you know, the, the helicopter prodigy designing a man carrying rocket. So it's just fun to see the young Stanley Hiller in a 1950 uh, Mechanics Illustrated article. But you know, here's an example of what we're talking about here, some of the unique aircraft. This is the Hiller Hornet. We have a prototype of it in our museum. Um, and what this is, is a, it's a little helicopter. And if you look at it, there's no engine in it. It has no engine. And what it has is a passenger carrying compartment. It has a spinning rotor. It has a, a fuel tank in the back somewhere and fuel lines going up in the interior of the rotor blades up to the ends where there's a ramjet, which is basically a tube of steel or metal. It's aluminum, I guess, or titanium, perhaps. I, I don't remember the material. Has no moving parts at all. So basically, if you get this thing moving by spinning the rotor, and I'm going to show you some film of it here in just a second, a video of it. Um, you, all you have to do is get the thing moving and get some fuel squirting into the chamber there and ignite it. And just the ram pressure of the air will create a little combustion chamber there. And this thing will start to generate thrust with no moving parts. So this ramjet tipped helicopter. And there it is kind of at dusk with the ring of fire coming out of the ramjets as it spins around. And you can imagine this thing flying around in the skies of Palo Alto in the 1950s. You know, this is where UFO sightings come from, from this kind of thing. Uh, the Army actually was interested to test the idea and they made a, uh, Hiller made a small fleet of them, mostly prototype aircraft. There they all are lined up for the Army, Army's delivery. But they really never went into production. So let me see if I can uh, play some of it. There's two, two videos here. One 
uh, from a newsreel and then a silent video. At Palo Alto, California, the world's first jet helicopter is unveiled by its inventor, youthful Stanley Hiller Jr. The essence of simplicity, the helicopter is powered by two small jet engines which weigh only 11 pounds each and have no moving parts. In a matter of minutes, they can be attached to the tips of the rotor. The plane is practically foolproof and fuel-proof. It runs on almost anything that burns. Gasoline, kerosene, diesel fuel, or even castor oil. The plane flies with only two controls and has fewer gadgets than the average automobile. And this one here where there is uh, no audio for, um, you can see the actual prototype Hiller Hornet, the one that we have in our uh, collection. This is the rotor being tested here. There it is, getting the ramjet put on. And watch how they, first they're gonna cram some people into the, into the cockpit, there they are. And he's got a drill that he's using to wind up the rotor, there's no engine. So he's winding it up. Every home should have one of these. And there it is in flight. You're gonna to have to make the wailing siren sound that it made all on your own. Now there's a little bit of, of night filming here. It's not super great. This was done in like 1954 or something like that. Um, but you'll be able to see it there. You can see the rotors uh, flaming out there, um, spinning up. And it'll be hard to see, but there'll be a very ghostly blue ring uh, visible as this thing flies off into the night. There it is. The Hiller Hornet. And again, every, every home should have one. Another interesting aircraft from Hiller, and I'm gonna have to skip through these quickly here because I'm re gonna reach the end of my time here. Um, the Hiller Flying Platform made the pages of Colliers uh, in 1955. So this, this got into the popular imagination. So there's two rotors down in that ducted fan there spinning, counter-rotating and generating uh, thrust and the pilot literally uses his own body weight to fling the the aircraft around as needed and there it is in flight there for the most part you would not want to fly this thing any higher than you could jump uh, but they did get it up high for some of these publicity shots i'm going to skip the video because we're out of time uh, almost. The interesting thing about the flying platform, it, though, is the ducted fan. It wasn't that the Army wanted to create some sort of a personal flying vehicle. It's, they wanted to use the ducted fan to put them on vehicles, regular ground vehicles, and turn them into flying vehicles. And the idea wasn't so that they could have these things zipping around the sky. They only needed them to fly in ground effect about three or four feet above the surface of the, of the ground. And the reason for it is they wanted a vehicle that could fly without touching the, the surface of a radioactive battlefield. So that's a very scary thought that these things were being built for uh, some, some sort of horrible apocalyptic war scenario. But that was the idea of the ducted fans was to create some sort of a propulsion system that would go on a flying car. And of course, that's where the idea of the flying car came from. So this is a really cool Popular Mechanics magazine from 1957, projecting 10 years into the distant far future of 1967, when everyone was gonna have their Hiller flying sedan. And that of course is where we get the, where's my flying car today? So there it is. What happened was Hiller worked out all the kinks of the ducted fan and then the army gave the contract to other companies to try to actually build the cars. So this is a Piasecki flying car right here. Of course, nothing became of it. And in a, 
a less brilliant move, the army thought, well, Chrysler builds cars. All we have to do is give them the ducted fan blueprints and they can stick them in one of their cars. It didn't work so well, but Chrysler actually built a air Jeep in 1959. <laughs> The Hiller Rotor Cycle is another interesting prototype built by uh, Stanley Hiller Jr. and the Hiller Aircraft Company. This is a uh, helicopter that in pieces fits into a small pod that's about eight feet long that can be dropped from a aircraft using a parachute. And this pod can land and a pilot who's downed uh, and needs a, a quick way out can pull this helicopter in pieces out of the pod, put it together in less than five minutes and fly it out of there. And maybe this is some sort of version of what might have happened if there were a lot of these things. But uh, the, the Hiller rotor cycle, again, these are the kinds of prototypes that Stanley Hiller Jr. would build, hoping for a production contract with the military, and they never materialized. One of the last major activities of the Hiller Aircraft Company was a joint product project with Vought, Chance Vought Aircraft and RAND. I'm sorry, with Ryan Aircraft, not RAND. RAND's a research organization. So Ryan Aircraft, Chance Vought, and Hiller producing a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. So the entire wing tilts up to create vertical lift, to lift this aircraft off the ground, and then it transitions to a horizontal uh, uh, form so that it can fly horizontally. And so these are pictures of this thing. It actually flew in the 1964 uh, time frame, and it's a precursor of an aircraft like the V-22 Osprey, which is also a tilt engine, vertical lift and vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. But the difference is, you know, decades between the two aircraft. And the, the reason for it is what the aircraft did not have in the 1960s, what it desperately needed was digital controls. Uh, because of all the instabilities and other issues about flying the aircraft, just the human reaction time even of a test pilot for some of the different phases of the flight were problematic uh, to control the aircraft. So, you know, the V-22 uh, is a much later generation aircraft with the digital controls needed to properly control the aircraft. But, you know, the Hiller Aircraft Company and its partners kind of pioneered the concept. So this is the Stanley Hiller story. So this is a guy who just is a young teenager, kind of the archetype of the uh, Bay Area entrepreneur. He had a dream and he found people to help make his dream come true. Sort of the uh, archetype of the Bay Area entrepreneur that we all hear so much about. So Stanley Hiller Jr., the boy wonder, the inventor, uh, created an incredible legacy. And of course the Hiller Aviation Museum was founded by Stanley Hiller in 1998 uh, when we opened and that was you know, 22 years ago now. And uh, we're celebrating the invention and innovation of aviation pioneers before and after Stanley Hiller. So I hope you enjoyed that brief uh, tour of uh, Stanley Hiller Jr. You get a little sense of who this guy was. And if you have any questions, I guess you can submit them into the chat and I will uh, answer them as best I can. Did Hiller make his own engines? No, he did not. So the, the two engines that we see a lot are Franklin engines and Lycoming engines. Um, the Franklin engine was the one in his XH-44. And I don't know all the very different, different types of, of, of Franklin engines, but it was the Franklin engine that was, was the kind of the workhorse for his early helicopters. So not like the Wright brothers where they had to make their own engine. You know, he, he basically got a, a production engine. Well, he died as an old man. Uh, Stanley Hiller passed away in 2006, I believe. Um, and, you know, he was in his 80s. And he, you know, complications related to being uh, an older gentleman is what he uh, eventually passed away from. So there wasn't anything traumatic or anything like that. He, he died uh, uh, from complications of old age. So, yeah, and again, the, you know, he, he had collected aircraft. Um, in a warehouse in Redwood City, which was sort of the precursor to the Hiller Aviation Museum, 
Um, over the years, he had gotten uh, a hold of different aircraft, especially some early aircraft. He had uh, models of a lot of his helicopters, and he felt that there needed to be a place where we, he could display some of this. He wasn't really interested in putting uh, a museum together to just be a shrine to Hiller. In fact, when the museum opened, it wasn't called the Hiller Aviation Museum. It was just called Aviation Museum. If you look on the early pictures of the building, it just says Aviation Museum. He didn't even want his, his name on there, but he was convinced that he needed to brand the building with something. So he did put, put his name on it. We are the Hiller Aviation Museum. And, uh, you know, the original 15 to 18 aircraft that the museum started with, we now have over 50 different kinds of aircraft. And, and it's, it's not a helicopter museum, it's a museum of aircraft innovation and invention. Uh, and we feature, of course, some of the helicopters developed by the young Stanley Hiller Jr. So anyway, uh, it looks like we've reached the end of the questions. Um, I want to thank you for coming tonight for uh, Hiller Hangar Talk on this crazy night with all the things going on in the news. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank our sponsor, Provident Credit Union. And we're going to be gathering here in another two weeks for a Hangar Talk on Wednesday, January 20th, as we present Flying International Freight Amidst the Pandemic with Michael Maniero. And in the meantime, stay safe, everybody. And have a great start to your new year in 2021. Good night.